Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, good to have everybody back and uh, another cup of coffee under your belt. And we're ready for another half hour. And uh, for those of you joining us on television, again, if you're just catching us for the first time, I don't even like to repeat what some people say as they flipping through and what they see and the blackboard. And, but anyway, it stops them for a minute, and uh, that's usually long enough. And so if you're just turning in, tuning in for the first time, we always like to emphasize that we're just a simple verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. We started back in Genesis. And uh, we've worked our way through the scriptures, and uh, we're getting closer and closer to the end. And of course, now the questions are coming, you know. Well, where are you going to go when you end back here in Jude and Revelation? Well, I'm not ready to just set it in concrete, but I'm toying with the idea that we'll go back and uh, spend some time in Isaiah or uh, some of the Old Testament prophets that uh, are real uh, minds of learning. Okay, let's uh, come back to where we were in Jude, one chapter, and we were in verse 7, and again, I ran out of time, as usual, and so we'll finish up our thought for a little bit before we go on into verse 8, but verse 7 again, <clears throat> I don't like to run this thing into the ground, but on the other hand, since it's something that we're up against today, like no other time in our national history, we have to see what the Word of God says doesn't matter what I think or what any other group thinks. It's what does the Word of God say about it. All right, Jude, verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, everybody I trust knows the story of Lot and Sodom. And the cities about them, in other words, the suburbs, little small villages out around them, who also were living in like manner, of course, giving themselves over to fornication, that is, into the grosser, means of immorality, and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example. Now that's the only point I'm making, is that all these things were written, as Paul says in Romans 15, for our, what? Learning. They won't necessarily show you salvation, they won't present the gospel, but they're back there for our learning to know how God has dealt with these things in the past. All right, and so they were set forth as an example. And as such, they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, of course, we know that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with fire and brimstone. But that was only the, the here and the now. It also sent them into their eternal punishment, which, of course, will be... Uh, consummated at the great white throne. All right, now we went back to 2 Peter in the last half minute of our last half hour. So let's go back and finish that verse before we move on into verse 8. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 2. And again, <clears throat> the Scriptures find it necessary to repeat this and repeat it and repeat it. Then who am I to ignore it? We just cannot do it. All right, 2 Peter. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 6. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 6. And all we want people to know is what does the Word of God say about it? I'm not going to judge them. God is. I'm not going to tell them one thing or another. All I can say is that God will save to the uttermost anyone who comes unto Him and accepts these things by faith. Paul makes the graphic statement that where sin amounts, what's always greater? Grace. The grace of God. So we never call these people hopelessly lost. We have to show them, Lord, that in the view or the mind of God, they are in a gross situation. All right, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, or 6 rather. And he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes as a result of the fire and brimstone. So he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them, in other words, condemned their guilt, condemned them with an overthrow, making them a what? An example that would teach coming generations how God feels about this kind of immorality. 
All right, and he's going to make them an example unto those that should after live that kind of a lifestyle. Now, verse 7, out of that immoral environment, God delivered Lot, the just man, who was vexed, knowing better, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man, Lot, who had the same faith that Abraham had, evidently, for that righteous man dwelling among them, that is, the Sodom and Gomorrahites, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds, or their lifestyle. And so the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, as he did Lot, and to reserve the unjust, those who stayed in Sodom, to reserve them to the day of judgment to be punished. Well, that's what the Word of God says about it. It's not what I say, it's what the Word says, and we better be ready to stand for it. All right, now let's go back to Jude and we'll move on. And this whole little book of Jude now is dealing with examples of unbelief and God's judgment simply to show us that God hasn't changed. And what He's judged in the past, He will judge again. And so any nation that falls under this kind of an influence is ripe for judgment. All right, now verse 8. Likewise, in other words, on the, on the same level, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. They despise dominion. Now, doesn't that ring a bell? What have we just seen? Just exactly that. They don't care what law says. They don't care what government decrees. They'll do what they want to do. All right? And so they despise dominion and they speak evil <coughs> of dignity. Now, you know the Scripture in another place says that one of the signs of the end time is when they will call right wrong and wrong right, when they will call black white and they'll call white black, and we're there. We're there. That's what makes me feel that we're so close to the end. All these things that have been prophesied are now rolling in over the planet. All right, now verse 9. Here we shift gears again and we go into something totally removed from the Sodom and Gomorrah environment. Now we jump up to Michael the archangel, verse 9, when contending with the devil, there's that old Satan again, that constant adversary, he disputed about the body of Moses and dared not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Now there's always been a lot of controversy and a lot of questions. Who is or what is this controversy between Michael and this body of Moses. Well, goodness, we know that there was no controversy over Moses' physical body. That was buried up there on Mount Nebo. So it has to be something else. All right, now let's just take a different take than what I know you're used to seeing. Let's go back with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, honey. Verse 1. And I'm going to try and do this in a way that maybe you can come to the conclusion yourself of what it's talking about. So be thinking. Don't just be reading. Be thinking. That's the name of the game. All got it? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's start at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant now, you know, Paul is always trying to bring people out of ignorance and into the knowledge. Now, ignorance is not a lack of brain cells. You've heard me say that a hundred times. I've said it once. Ignorance is a, simply a lack of having been taught. We are all ignorant of a lot of things. And I always use the example, electricity. I'm ignorant of it. I haven't learned that much about it. I can flip a light switch, and that's probably about the limit of it. But you see, for people who study it, they're knowledgeable. They know exactly what's going on on those light wires. Now, it's the same way with spiritual things. Most people are untaught. They've never heard these things before. 
And I think that's part of my ministry, is to open up the Scriptures so that people can be taught and understand and not remain ignorant. All right? So he says, I would that you should not be ignorant, untaught. And how that our fathers, speaking of the fathers of the nation of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now we're all the way up to Moses, of course, in, in Egypt, and how our fathers were under the cloud. Now, you all remember the story of Israel coming out of Egypt, how the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, all right? And so all our fathers, all the Israelites coming out of Egypt were under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea in mass with, I don't think, a single one lost. Now read on. They were all baptized unto Moses. Not with water, but with an act of God. They were placed into Moses' leadership. They were under Moses' protective care. You remember when they needed water? Who did they go running to? Moses. We need water. Our people are thirsty. The livestock are thirsty. Then Moses, in turn, of course, goes to God. God tells him what to do. But they were literally placed by an act of God under Moses' leadership and control. All right? And consequently, they were all in the cloud and in the sea under Moses' leadership. Verse 3, they did all eat the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they all drank of that spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. All right, now let's compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, I want you thinking, who is the body of Moses that we're dealing with in the book of Jude? Now turn over to 1 Corinthians, page or two more, chapter 12. And this should help you put it together. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. Let's start at verse 12. Okay, 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 12. And remember now, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking to you and I as Gentiles in this age of grace. For as the body, the human body, is one, and it hath many members. In other words, all our extremities and all of our organs, they're all part of one body. And all our members of that one body, being many, they're still one body. So also is Christ, or the body of Christ. Now verse 13. Now keep your mind on what he said about Moses. For by one Holy Spirit, we as believers are all baptized into one what? Body. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we bond or free, we have been all made to drink in one spirit, for the body is not one member but many. All right, so what do you suppose was the body of Moses that Satan was deliberating over? The nation of Israel. Come back and read it again. Now come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 again. Put this all together. The Gentiles have all been baptized into the body of Christ as this functional organism, universal in its breadth, but we're all there by virtue of our saving faith and an act of the Spirit, and we are all one in Christ regardless of who or what we are. All right, now jump back to the Exodus. All our fathers, verse 1, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all what? Baptized. Not with water. The Red Sea was what? Dry. They didn't get wet. So what kind of a baptism was? An act of God that placed them into what? Moses' leadership. And so what did they become? They became a body, a spiritual body, the body of Moses, because he was the one who was their leader by God's sovereign grace. We're in the body of Christ with that same sovereign God accomplishing it. Now, with what I said a program or two ago, remember, 
why are the Jewish people so hated and detested and tried to be obliterated from the human experience? Satan. The devil wants to get rid of them. Now, let's go back and use a verse that I think just nails that down, that Israel is at the heart of all of God's dealing with the human race. Come back with me to Deuteronomy. <clears throat> chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. That's a long ways back, so it's going to take you a while to find it. I know. We'll take time because, you know, our listeners write the same thing. Don't go so fast, otherwise I can't find the references. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we're going to jump in at verse Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. And don't forget this verse. Be ready to share it at every chance. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I wish I could just give the page in my Bible and you'd all have it. <laughs> verse 8. When the Most High, well, that's a term of deity the term of the Old Testament creator, God himself. So when the Most High, the sovereign God of the universe, divided to the nations, that is of the world, when he divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated by divine decree, they all went into their separate areas of the planet, and when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds or the boundaries of the people, of these various nations and peoples, according to what? The number of the children of Israel. What does that tell you? Everything that God determined for the human race rested on the nation of Israel. Geographically. Geographically, what is the absolute center of the world, the earth? Jerusalem. It's the center of everything. Now stop and think, as I said a program or two back, if Satan can succeed in getting rid of the nation of Israel, then there's no way end time prophecy can be fulfilled because Israel has to be in the land. Israel has to be there to have the king. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Come back with me to Matthew. This is just one little instance. I could sit here from now until next week and show you these same kind of proofs that Israel has to be in the land for the return of Christ and their king. Matthew 19. Verse 27. Matthew 19, verse 27. Because this is so plainly put. You don't have to be a degreed theologian to understand this. You know, I made it on one of the past programs. You know what old Tyndale said way back in his day as they were burning him at the stake? He wanted every plowboy in England to have a copy of the Word. And I like that because what does that tell you? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this book. If you've got the leading of the Holy Spirit, you can understand it as well as 10 PhDs. That's what it amounts to. All right, now here is as plain as day. Why does Israel have to be in the land for the return of their king? Verse 27 of Matthew 19. This is during his earthly ministry, toward the end of it. And, of course, the twelve have been with him, and they've given up all of their good things of life, you might say, their occupation, their family life, to follow the Lord. All right. Then answered Peter, and he said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. Now, do you get what he's saying? They turned their back on the lifestyle that they had enjoyed. They lost a good portion of their family life because they were with him. And so now Peter says, well, what are we going to get for all this? And the Lord doesn't scold him, not at all. 
And he says, what shall we have, therefore? And I always make the point, he's not talking about salvation. He's got that. That's evident back there in John's Gospel when Jesus was washing their feet. I think it's chapter 13. And you remember Peter didn't want Jesus to wash his feet? Kind of stuck them back under him, I imagine. And Jesus said, if I can't wash your feet, you can have no part with me. And you know, Peter had a way of sticking his foot in his mouth. What did he say next? Well, then give me a bath. And what did the Lord tell him? Peter, you don't need a bath. You've been, what's the word the Lord used? You've been washed. See, you've been washed. You're saved. You're secure. But we're walking in this old filthy world, and so what do we need? Symbolically, our feet washed. Okay, so now Peter isn't talking about that. He's talking about reward. What are we going to have there for? Now look at the answer and see if this could ever happen if the Jews were obliterated. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you who have followed me, now that'll be 11 of the 12, remember, in the regeneration, in other words, when he puts the earth back to its original Edenic state, beautiful, without the curse, it's going to be heaven on earth, all right? In the regeneration, when the Son of Man, speaking of himself, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Son of God, when he shall sit in the throne of his glory. Well, now what does throne speak of? Kingdom and king. So when the Son of Man is returned and he sets up his kingdom and Christ is seated on the major throne in Jerusalem, I think on David's throne on Mount Zion. Now look what the rest of the verse says. You also, the twelve. Now it's not going to be Judas, it's going to be Matthias. But the twelve will sit upon Twelve thrones, judging or ruling the twelve tribes of Israel. Could that be fulfilled if the Jews are obliterated? Well, of course not. That would end it all. There could be no kingdom. There'd be no reason for Christ to return. The whole thing falls apart if Israel disappeared. All right, now I'm thinking of another verse. Jump all the way back again to the Old Testament. You know, I told you one time, somebody wrote and said, I misnamed my program. It should be back and forth in the Bible. <laughs> well, that's all right with me. Let's see, where was I going to go? Now I lost my line of thought. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> the 12 tribes ruling. Goodness, I lost it. <laughs> Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah. You know, I, I share with people so often, and I can do this on the program because I think you all feel like you know me as well as you do your own family. Years ago, I was teaching down in McAllister, and the dear man has gone on to be with the Lord, and he had a unique grin. And he'd always sit right about over here where Gordon is sitting. And whenever I did something foolish or if I dropped something, he'd look up and grin and he said, ain't going to get any better. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm finding that out. It just doesn't get better. Those things keep compounding. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 31. Now we're on the whole idea that Israel cannot, dare not disappear. Because if they did, everything would fall apart. The Word of God would become moot. We could just as well throw it in the trash can and go home. It would be worthless. But they're not, because the Word of God is true. Now look what it says. Jeremiah 31, dropping down to verse 35. And be ready to show this people when they get anti-Israel with you, when they get anti-Semitic, and they try to prove that they shouldn't be there in the Holy Land. Yes, they have to be. They have to be, or God's word could never be fulfilled. All right, verse 35, Thus saith the Lord, this is the word of God, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night. This is the Creator speaking. And who divides the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Now here it comes, verse 36, If, if those ordinances, that is of the sun and the moon and the stars in their orbits. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then 
the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me. You think the sun's ever going to fall out of its place? You think the stars are going to fall out of orbit? Uh-uh. And as long as they don't, then the promise is secure. The nation of Israel is going to stay in place. It has to. Next verse. Verse 37. Thus saith the Lord, if, there it is again, it's conditional, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off the seed of Israel. But that's never going to happen. Man can't do it. And for all that they have done, saith the Lord. And so we have this promise of God's word that the nation of Israel will never disappear, even though Satan thinks he's still going to succeed. And like I said in an earlier program, I don't know where he's got his intellect, but he can't get it through his head that he's not going to succeed. But he keeps trying. He just doesn't give up. All right? Now then, let's go back. My, that Only a minute left again. Back to Jude. See, and I thought, I thought I'd have a hard time getting through the afternoon without going someplace else. And we're not even halfway through Jude yet. Okay, well, that's what makes it fun, isn't it? This is fun. All right, Jude, now we'll just, just drop down to verse... Now, let's read verse 9 again, now that you see what I'm talking about. Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil and disputed the body of Moses over Israel. Michael has to do his part to protect the nation of Israel. And he dared not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Because after all, the Lord is the one who has the power. All right, now then verse 10. But these, these filthy dreamers, these horrible false teachers that are coming upon the world, these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Now, what's it telling us? Well, again, these people who know nothing of the truth of the Word of God, these people who have nothing of the Holy Spirit's teaching and instruction, they spew out this stuff that is nothing but a foul ball concerning spiritual things. And they cannot, they cannot teach truth because they just don't know what it is. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.